there's a lot of tactics and manipulation that are used in these other films. Just to yeah. give you an example, like in What the Health, they pretend they're kind of journalists going to figure things out, but they're but they're not. I mean, they're act they're play acting. Right. That's dishonest. That's and very dishonest. So but I think uh it's it's hard to know when you are like an innocent viewer, these films seem super convincing. I'm you know I've 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 I stay away from a lot of documentaries. Yeah. Because again, like once you have those images in your mind, you you really are your brain has a hard time eliminating that. Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Documentaries are by definition films that are used to deliver facts about a particular subject and hopefully document something we are interested in learning more about. I first started my watching documentaries journey because I thought they would provide a trusted resource filled with truths that would help us see the world through a different perspective or simply advance our understanding and knowledge. Now, now what is the actual truth is the question, and can it be presented in a neutral way that is removed from bias? As I got more experience watching documentaries, I learned that I needed to ask a simple question. What led the person who created the documentary to create it in the first place? Then I had an aha moment. It may actually take bias to motivate someone to want to spend his or her valuable time working on a documentary in the first place. Now, this realization helped me understand the importance of looking at any documentary through the lens of skepticism, which is what we will do today. Today, I wanted to spend a little time talking about the twin study documentary on Netflix entitled You Are What You Eat and discuss it through the lens of an investigative journalist so that we all will have some clarity as to whether this documentary is simply propaganda or a documentary we can trust. Today's guest is Nina Teichos. Nina Teichos uh, is a science journalist and author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Big Fat Surprise, Why Meat, Butter, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet, which upended the conventional wisdom on dietary fat, especially saturated fat. Now, she's also the founder of the Nutrition Coalition, a not-for-profit working to ensure that nutrition policy reflects a transparent process and is self you know, as, and is evidence-based. Uh, she graduated from Stanford and Oxford and previously served as direct, associate director of the Center of Globalization and Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Today, I wanted to have her on to talk about an amazing article on Substack that she wrote uh, along with Gary Tobbs, and that will be the foundation of today's conversation. My friend, Nina, and I should call you Dr. Nina because I heard you got a PhD. Yeah, <laughs> I welcome you to today's episode. How are you doing? Thank you. It's great to be here, Tony. I, that's a long introduction to me. I want to make one correction, uh, which is that th this particular article, I have a sub stack that I yeah. write with Gary Taubes. This particular article I wrote. Okay. And then Gary Wright has written a bunch of other articles. Got you. So that. you guys are joining forces to add value to Substack and... That that works. Perfect. Well, basically, I feel, I mean, just to diverge a little bit, I really feel looking around the nutrition journalism landscape, and this is part of this conversation about journalism and documentaries that you brought up. There really are no critical journalists in nutrition. Mm. Every like in on the right and the left, no matter where you look in media, journalists are basically delivering what the experts say without any critical lens. And I find that, and they don't follow the money. You know, in any field of journalism, there are journalists who follow the money, but they don't do that in nutrition science, you know, almost, I mean, almost at all. So I started this Substack, and then Gary Tobbs joined me to really be a trusted source for nutrition journalism. Mm -hmm. you know, we can change the state of journalism out there. I think there's really a need for this kind of work. Yeah, and the definition of journalism is that it should be just that, and it's a sad state of affairs that it hasn't become uh, what it should be. 
uh, is kind of trend. And if you look at TV, journalists are more kind of selling a political perspective as opposed to being journalists. I remember Walter Jacobson in Chicago was a journalist, and he was known for kind of you know breaking through the noise and sharing you know investigative stories that uh, you just don't see like you did in the past. So hopefully you guys can kind of help lead the way because we need a little clarity uh, and lack of bias so that people can make better decisions. So, yeah, I mean, I just want to say, I think both Gary and I have evolved to have similar biases. When Mm -hmm. I started writing, when I started out my research to write the big fat surprise, I really had no idea where I would come out. In fact, it was supposed to be a book just on trans fats. And then I researched and I researched and I thought, wow, this is so much, such a bigger story. But I didn't come with any preconceptions about what I intended to do. And, And I think for Gary, it was the same, probably him 30 years ago. So, But now it's fair to say that we have certain biases about what we think the scientific evidence says, and we're open about that. Yeah. I think that's fine. We're we're not newbie journalists coming to the field. And I think it's fine. We, we, you know, we state our biases and we let people know, and it's still important to have investigative work where you're looking at the money trail and you're taking a rigorous critical eye to the science because it just doesn't exist anywhere else current currently in the journalism landscape. That's right. So I do think journalists can come honestly to, to writing an article, a book or a documentary and really mm-hmm. not know what they're getting themselves into. Mm-hmm. But as we talk about today about the vegan twin study, that was just almost certainly not the case. <laughs> That's right. And, it, and I believe that. And I, I think that again, it, there probably isn't, such a thing as a completely unbiased person. So in fact, if the Supreme Court is not unbiased, it's it's just not possible to exist on a planet and have bias. So again, I think full disclosure is the most important thing, but, but, but credibility is important. When I got my master's in nutrition, it was partly because of credibility I was seeking when I was as a board certified obesity doctor it was partly due to credibility. You decided to get a PhD. So I'm curious, what was your motivation for diving into the world of a PhD? So it's pretty much exactly what you just described. I, I don't want to be called just a journalist. Right. And I've now erased that line as connected to me. And Maybe a hundred people told me your book is a PhD. Your book is a PhD. So I was able to find in the UK only, and only in the UK they offer PhDs by public by published works. My book, almost a dozen articles in peer-reviewed journals that I've published over the years, that was the basis of my PhD. And um, and I'm it it took about a year, and I'm happy that I did it. So I think now it opens certain doors for me and it just allows me to have a greater level level of create uh, credibility in this world. Cool. So, you know, if, if you ask me, what do I think of PhDs in nutrition? I would say there are a lot of the, those letters do not signify much <laughs> generally, but I'm glad that I have them. So that's, yeah, it. I agree. I, I, I went into my master's in nutrition with bias towards low carb and that did not change. And I, I spent a lot of that time, you know, having great, great discussion with my professor. So it was actually nice to have bias because I didn't just go there just for them to fill my brain. I actually questioned everything. So it actually made my education, I think more, it was just a better way to learn knowing the things that I knew. So did you can actually work hmm? at all? Did you feel like you were ever penalized? Not at all. I my final paper, shockingly, was basically my rationale for low carb versus low fat, and I got a hundred percent. So, <laughs> and my my professor for that class was a plant based doctor. So, so 
I they earned my respect because I knew they were not going to let their bias affect how they viewed me. And that was very, very nice to see. I also particularly did my training with University of Western States because they had the functional medicine component. So I wanted to get some of that root cause of why we get sick education. So now speaking of education, we had the privilege of celebrating Dr. Sarah Hallberg, and I was one of the people invited to participate in this course that helped teach the public the potential that you can reverse type 2 diabetes. So it was really an honor to not only teach that message, but to honor her. So in your own words, I would like you to say to my audience, who is Dr. Sarah Hallberg? What do you love about her the most? And why did we decide to have this wonderful course? <laughs> okay. For people who don't know the name Dr. Sarah Halberg, you need to pause this podcast and watch her TED Talk, Dr. Sarah Halberg, H-A-L-L-B-E-R-G. It's been viewed more than 11 million times. And she is a dynamo. She is, she was a, she's passed away from cancer two years ago, almost exactly. And she, she was a medical doctor who actually, she was first an exercise physiologist, wanted to learn more, be more into prevention, trained to be a doctor, practiced regular medicine for a number of years, used to tell the story about how she would come home and say, I am so miserable. I feel like I'm just like a legal drug dealer. Mm. And then she was given the opportunity at the University of uh, Indiana Arnett Health System to open an obesity clinic, clinic. She spent a year combing through all the science and the data. She opened the clinic as a low carb clinic. She had previously been like a Dean Ornish low fat devotee. And she opens a low carb clinic for obesity. And quickly she discovers, wow, we're reversing people's type two diabetes. And by reversal, I mean that they're backing out of a diagnosis of type two diabetes. Yes. If you start to eat a high carbohydrate diet, the disease will come back. It's not a cure, but she liked the term reversal for the reason that it gave patients hope. Mm -hmm. And that like cancer, if you maintain a low carbohydrate diet, you can you can recover in a sense from type right. two diabetes and never go back to having the condition. She was a tremendous advocate of type two diabetes reversal. Then she became the medical director of Verda Health, the first company in the world, the biggest company now with more than a hundred fortune 500 uh, five company clients using a ketogenic diet combined with a mobile app to reverse people's type two diabetes, get them on the diet, help them along. They now work with prediabetes and they also work with obesity. Sarah was their first medical director. And then super importantly, she was the, pro the PI, the lead investigator on their clinical trial, which is the largest and longest, although non-randomized, but controlled clinical trial to date on this concept of using a ketogenic diet to reverse type 2 diabetes. And let me just give you a quick little fact from that. Half the population in her study reversed their diabetes in 10 weeks. And mm. five years later, they had maintained that roughly that portion of people. So, I mean, it was a remarkable trial. And she, what did I love about her? <laughs> she was, she, first of all, for the field of diabetes, she was maybe the most gifted communicator I have ever seen. She is you should look up every lecture of hers you can find. She is such a crystal clear, energized, beautiful communicator. She was a really brilliant scientific mind. She really figured a lot of stuff out. She was incredibly motivated to help her patients. She mentored people. She took care of people. She wanted to be there to touch their back, see them through this process, be with them, be on a journey with them. She loved people. And then, and then she became interested, as I had been, in changing policy so that people mm -hmm. were not getting 
basically bad, erroneous, harmful dietary guidelines. And she became the chair of this group that I founded called the Nutrition Coalition. And then we became, I mean, practically best friends. We were so close. And I I just love <laughs> Sarah. When she passed away, well, maybe a maybe weeks before she passed away, I visited her in West Lafayette, Indiana, and she told me that she wanted more than anything, a course on reversing diabetes Mm -hmm. addressed to healthcare professionals to be hosted by the Cardiometabolic Health Congress. Why that group? Because she uniquely had been invited to the main stage to deliver her, you know, very unorthodox views. Again, because she was such a personable person. And so she wanted to use that that accomplishment for that to live on. So I was able, so then I set up a GoFundMe account. We raised a lot of money from people who donated after she passed away. And I was able to organize this course. I mean, first to convince this group that they should do it because they're a very conventional mainstream group, really mainstream. And then to organize the cor- course, you participated, Tony. You were fantastic. We had wonderful faculty for this half-day course. It is. It will very soon be available online for people to take. And we're still working on the CME credit part of it. So I think, yeah, I mean, I've, I feel like this really was her wish. And she really wants people to know type 2 diabetes can be reversed. It's possible with diet alone. Don't give up hope. <laughs> and, you know, that's her message. So I think, sorry, I probably spoke too much about her, but I think I, I'm i so happy to be able to preserve and carry on her legacy. Yeah. Well, when I asked the question, I knew from the invite and how you uh, moderated and how you spoke of her, that she meant a lot to you. I didn't know she was that close to you. Didn't even know she chaired the Nutrition Coalition. So I I feel inspired because all of us need somebody to look to, to help us understand how to define our purpose. And her purpose is similar to mine, which is I, I simply want to help as many people at least have the awareness that you can reverse type 2 diabetes. And if you're like my wife who has type 1, you can have a normal A1C with type 1 diabetes, but you can't do it with medicine alone. You have to understand that you have to remove the thing that causes the damage, and that's excessive carbs. So I'm happy I asked that question. I am going to make sure that we share a link to that video you shared, her TED Talk with 11 or so million or so views, maybe to Verta Health, because Verta Health can go direct to the consumer to help people who are not in a, in a health system that understands this. And of course, to the course that we offered, because I think people need to be aware that Okay, let's get this information and let's then start taking the steps to heal. So thank you. What a great way to start our conversation. Now, for purposes of this discussion, where we're going to talk about your Substack article, you the article started, you know, you know, with this, it was the vegan study that, you know, happened. It, it basically, you start your article entitled The Ve- Vegan Study by, you, you talked about Dartmouth University and that they did some- Just Go through it? Yeah, so explain no, it. And, but, it. Before, but before you explain it, before you explain it, I want to ask you a question. So let me ask you this, this broader question. Yeah. A documentary about the carnivore diet presented the same way this diet was presented. Do you think, because this diet, this, this documentary seems to be well received. It seems to be, you know, people tend to kind of take it for face value. But do you think if a carnivore documentary was presented, it would have had the same fanfare? Well, I mean, def- definitely not, right? I think we know there's uh, 
unequal playing field out there when it comes to different kinds of diets. Uh, And there's just a tremendous bias in the media in favor of a plant-based diet, a plant-based, if not fully vegan. And the way I start off my piece is by setting up this hypothetical to help people understand how outrageous the, this vegan twin study and the documentary made from it, how, how outrageous they were. And I say, imagine if Cargill Meats launched a center at, say, Dartmouth University to promote the carnivore diet, right? Mm -hmm. And that it was led by a professor who'd been carnivore for 40 plus years. And it was funded by a billionaire philanthropy devoted entirely to promoting carnivore products. Mm -hmm. And then it was this same philanthropy also gave more than a million dollars to produce a Netflix film on the study, which it does. And then, and then the film comes out just several weeks after the study is published and that the entire Dartmouth Center is underwritten by Cargill Meats, <laughs> the whole center. So you would, you can just imagine the uproar that would ensue about the conflicts of interest, the meat industry funding for this. There's no meat funding. There, there are. There's almost like I'm always accused of being funded by meat, which I'm not. So in in our world, people with non-existent imaginary ties to meat are criticized. I mean, it's, whereas this vegan documentary, so it's a vegan study by a professor at Stanford University that was made into a Netflix film. They knew it was going to be a Netflix film. They they started from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And his whole center is funded by Beyond Meat. That's Mm -hmm. the headline a five-year grant to establish his center. He's a committed vegan for 40 plus years. It's funded by a full, the the film is funded by, and the study, both the study and the film are funded by a foundation that's run by a guy who's part of the so-called vegan mafia of Silicon Mm -hmm. Valley. So committed to not just being vegan, but, but investing in vegan products and foods so they have a financial conflict of interest and a let's say an ideological belief set conflict of interest none of that has been reported by anyone in the media none of the people who covered the film that i mean i think the film got a decent amount of coverage but nothing Mm -hmm. like what the health if you remember Mm -hmm. that or game changers i think that the vegan bubble has deflated a bit and if you see some of the comments online, they're much more critical of this film. But those outrageous conflicts of interest, and I haven't even begun to tell you yeah. <laughs> the extent of those conflicts, none of that was reported by any of the media that covered this film. And, you know, there it's like, this is not hidden information that I dug up. Mm-hmm. Some of it, I went and found the foundation's File tax filings, and but the fact that the entire Stanford Center is funded by Beyond Meat is right there on mm-hmm. the center's page. Like you don't have to go, you don't have to search hard, you don't have to be an investigative journalist. Right, to find right, it. right. You just need to be doing a tiny, tiny bit of your just homework. Bit. So, you know, we can talk about the the study. We could talk about the film. I think you know, to me, it was very clear the film was a PR stunt. Mm-hmm. that they decided to do this study on twins because twins are fun, subject of two Shakespeare plays. We love twins, right? There's something fun. And, you know, even Christopher Gardner, the lead author on this study, the Stanford professor, he says that the twins are a riot to work with, mm-hmm. a good subject for a documentary, right? Mm-hmm. And, but I know Christopher Gardner, who's done quite a few clinical trials in the past, and he knows too, that only longer term studies of, I mean, his first trial was two years. And he knows that that's the only way you can get meaningful data about diet. This vegan twin study was two months long, mm-hmm. which is kind of, it's it's not really a credible length of time. It was maybe the shortest amount of time they could get away with. But it's very clear from the outset, he, you know, he has a strong, strong agenda and which we can discuss. Yeah. And 
aside from just himself being personally vegan and being funded by Beyond Meat. And he, you know, this was clearly the whole study was designed as a PR event. I think I that say without, you know, <laughs> without getting sued, I think there's a lot of evidence to support that statement. That's right. Yeah. Like there's a part of me who that wants to make sure the world has documentaries. And then there's a part of me that realizes that there's there's so much harm. Uh, my patients come to me excited many times after seeing uh, What the Hell for Game Changers. And, and when you think about documentaries in general, the you know, I kind of looked up, well, what's, what, what's been the most effective vegan documentaries? And number one, uh, it was ranked 21% effective was the Cowspiracy one. Number two was Earthlings at 17%. What the Health was 12%. Game Changers, 10%. And then, 10 of course, you had what? others. What is so that, the, the percentage? So they, these percentages are, they rank them by, by which documentaries are the most effective for messaging and uh, getting people to hear the message and, and impact change. And what ends up happening for my patients is they'll come to me after having seen it, and they're fairly convinced, particularly after what the health and forks over knives, I need to be a vegan or I need to be plant-based. And, and, and we can kind of dissect through some of the things that are not true I remember having Diana Rogers uh, on and we talked about, you know, are the cow burps really impacting the environment as much as other things? So, so part of me wants to have documentaries, but I see so much harm. And, and so how do we balance that? I know bias is going to be there. So what does the average person do when they're faced with, I want to learn some new stuff. I want to improve my health, yet I can't, I don't know what to trust anymore. So I think that's a hard question to answer. I mean, yeah. I think like, you know, it's been more than a decade now that the vegan movement decided it's far more effective to do a documentary with the scare tactics and the people and the success stories and the graphics and the animation and this right. far it connects to people emotionally mm -hmm. powerfully. And that is far more effective than fact sheets or booklets or whatever else they can put out. It's very clear to me. They have, there are a number of extremely talented people in Hollywood. James Cameron is one of them. And they are, you know, he's an Academy Award winning film director who are directing these films. They are meant to be propaganda. They're in no way do they represent a range of viewpoints. They're designed as propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so how do we poor, innocent, naive viewers know? I, I mean, I think it's very, I think you don't know. You don't know. And you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, everybody in this field has to, you know, you, you learn to be very skeptical yeah. of everything that you see. And I can't really, I can't give you a, like a very, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I know there are documentaries kind of on our side too, promoting the low carb mm -hmm. diet, telling our story, That's right. talking about the information as we see it. I do not think those films, which include a really excellent one called Fat Fiction, another one called The Magic Pill, yeah, great films. I do not see them using the same scare tactics and mm -hmm. manipulation. That there's a lot of tactics and manipulation that are used in these other films. Just to yeah. give you an example, like in What the Health, they pretend they're kind of journalists going to figure things out, but they're but they're not. I mean, they're act. They're play acting. Right. That's dishonest. That's and very dishonest. So, but I think uh, it's it's hard to know when you are like an innocent viewer. These films seem super convincing. I'm, you know, I've I've, I've, I've stay away from a lot of documentaries. Yeah. 
Because again, like once you have those images in your mind, you, you really are, your brain has a hard time eliminating that. Just to take another example that's completely random, but like in the TV series, The Crown, Mm -hmm. which was about, you know, the, the royal family in England, they portrayed events incorrectly, but the way they portray events is probably the way most of us now see that history because we're not reading all the books. And, you know, now we have this image of this, whatever. I I think it's, I think it's in some ways unfair Mm -hmm. because visual imagery is so much more powerful than, than the written word. Yeah. I mean, when I watched the, uh, I didn't watch the entire documentary, but when I was watching the twin study documentary on Netflix, it definitely is beautifully done. And they kind of mention the science a little bit, and then they'll start talking about stuff that's not directly related. And again, a lot of the visuals and the emotions that come with that. Uh, So I think people need to at least be aware that the person who made this film had bias. And so you should add it to your you know, maybe things that you think about. Like if I watch, if I have a bias in politics, I still watch the other networks that have a a opposite bias. And I just, so, so, and my bias will always make me pay attention to the part. I'm, I'm trying to like justify my position. So I'm always looking for flaws in what they're saying so that you're, you're going to do that. But the, the key is to go into these documentaries just because it's on TV, just because it's in a book, just because the expert you trust said it doesn't mean it's true. So I think we're always, should always question things, question things and trust things, but verify, trust, but verify. And I think the more you do that, you'll find holes. And if you keep finding holes, then that should affect how much you trust that resource. So one of the things that I would love to hear you talk about a little bit is one of the flaws I saw immediately when I saw it was, and I see this pretty much in the plant-based community as well, this focus on LDL cholesterol. Right. So when you, and I want to say this first, from a low fat to a low carb is the same guy that's kind of presenting research in a way that's not at the level of scientific scrutiny that we want it to be. I just thought that was ironic, but anyway. Okay, your sound went out there for a little while for me, so I missed a lot of what you said, but you don't have to repeat it. Just tell me what the question is and I'll try to pick up and not repeat a, not repeat what you said. I can't hear you. No, it's totally gone. I don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden... There you are. I don't know why. Yeah. Now there that you is are. weird. Yeah, it's back. You're. I hear you now. But tell yeah. me, just, can you summarize what I missed? Oh yeah, real, real. It's real simple. I was just saying that. First of all, the question is, why is a focus on LDL cholesterol not necessarily the best way for this documentary to judge whether or not? in the twin studies that a plant-based diet is better because it positively affects the LDL cholesterol. And I also mentioned that it was ironic that Chris Gardner and some of his previous research is what convinced me to go from low fat to low carb because he had studies that showed that the low fat was not superior to the low carb and that the low carb was superior. So it was just ironic that he's kind of Right. Flipped a little bit. And those studies were better. Like you said, they were like longer and they were more, they were of a higher quality and yeah. it just seems weird to flip. So sort of, but this focus on LDL cholesterol, okay. how do you, what's your thoughts on that? Okay. Talking about LDL cholesterol first. In the Verda trial, where they looked at the a ketogenic diet versus controls for reversal of diabetes, they published a cart a paper just on cardiovascular outcomes. I think there's 35 of them, markers of inflammation, cholesterol, all different kinds of markers. Every single one of them improves on a low carbohydrate diet, except LDL cholesterol, which by the way, over time by five years 
had normalized out. And there's been a subsequent paper that shows that LDL cholesterol returns back to normal on a low-carb diet. So it's a transitory effect, this raise in LDL cholesterol, but it's not a long-term effect. When you have 34 out of 35 cardiovascular risk factors getting better on a diet, Mm -hmm. one is going the wrong direction, what is your conclusion? That LDL cholesterol is not so reliable. And in fact, there are numerous studies that show that just as many people get heart attacks with high LDL cholesterol as low LDL cholesterol, there's a whole field of science that now challenges the validity or ability to accurately measure the ability, its predictive ability of LDL cholesterol. What do plant-based people focus on exclusively? LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. That is all they're focused on. One, because it always gets better on a plant-based diet, which is to say it drops. Two, I think, maybe this sounds cynical, but I think it's true. There are drugs to lower LDL cholesterol. There are no drugs to Mm. lower or no effective drugs to lower your triglycerides or raise your HDL cholesterol. So basically, the multi-billion dollar statin industry, which is the most successful drug in the history of pharmaceuticals, is going, it makes that a favored risk factor because that's the thing we can write prescriptions for. So Christopher Gardner is being very disingenuous when he focuses on LDL cholesterol. He's not the only one, so does the American Heart Association, so do a lot of other people, but it really does not give a complete or or even a even the start of an understanding of what your cardiovascular risk is interestingly the american heart association even though like its statement on saturated fat focuses mm-hmm. on ldl cholesterol if you look at their risk calculator to 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 calculate your long, your 10 year cardiovascular risk there is no input for ldl cholesterol right so they don't want to know that because it's not predictive right so for Christopher Gardner to focus on that is just entirely disingenuous yeah. in my view. And, yeah. you know, he knows better because as you said, he had done a two year experiment and then he had done a one year experiment comparing different diets. The first one is called the A to Z study, yeah. a, a really a landmark study compared the Ornish diet to the Atkins diet and the zone and South That's beach right. and Atkins came out yeah. the best yeah. on I every, that. That's on every the study store. I spoke of. What did Car- Christopher Gardner learn? Low carb diet is best. What has he done in every study since that study? Figure out a way to undercut the effectiveness of the low carb diet. So amazingly, in his next study, he, what did he do? What was the exact shenanigan? He like, he, he allowed everybody on the other diets to stay on their medications, but on the low carb diet, everybody had to get off all their medications or it was, it was something so unequal that it was just shocking. And in this study, instead of comparing vegan to low carb, he compares vegan to a relatively meaningless omnivore diet. What is, Mm -hmm. you know, what is that even? It's just, it's, it's not really, you know, he, he knows that low carb would beat out any other diet. So he Mm -hmm. just doesn't, he stays away from it. So I think you know, LDL cholesterol is not a good marker. It turns out, you know, other in other outcomes of his study, I think one of the most important one that I'm surprised he measured this, but he did, which was your the B12 mm-hmm. in the blood of the vegan dieters. B12 is only found in animal foods. It dropped by some huge percentage, I think like over 50% because mm-hmm. they, and B12 is essential for your neurological function, right. for all kinds of um, functionality in your body. And it, it, it dropped dramatically. And people should know out there, you can't, even if you take a supplement, not everybody absorbs B12 supplements That's very right. well. That's it's right. much better taken with food and really, and the, the, the B12 that people find in say yeast or other plant foods is not this is bioavailable as the B12 found in animal foods. But anyway, the other one other interesting thing about his study was that the vegan dieters lost more weight, but that very well could have been related to the fact that they just ate less. Mm-hmm. They spontaneously consumed less food because they all reported not liking the diet. 
And although people said, they asked them, would you continue, you know, the diet after the study? The omnivores said, yeah, we will. The, none of the vegans wanted to continue the diet. It's not a, it's not a well-liked diet, which is not the end of the world, but like you should like the, the food that you're eating. So I think it was, and it was a very short-term study, as I've said. So I think it was, it was not an honest study in my view. I think it was designed to be filmed and, um, you know, some other aspects of Christa Gar for Gardner that I discovered in writing this story. And you should know that your listeners should know that Christopher Gardner is hugely influential. He's on currently on the expert committee that decides the U.S. dietary guidelines, possibly the most powerful expert committee in the entire United States on nutrition, the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee. He has also been the head of the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee several times. He's hugely influential. And he his center, again, funded by Beyond Meat, they're very clear that they're not their mission actually is not to find out about diet. It's to promote a plant-based diet. They are an advocacy group at Stanford University. I'm not hearing you, Tony. I don't hear you again, but I'll just keep talking. So they're an advocacy group. He says that in his course, he doesn't even talk, that he teaches at Stanford. He doesn't even talk about health. He talks about climate change, animal welfare, labor rights. He says he doesn't even talk about health, even though he's a professor at the medical school. And I think most people assume that a medical school professor, especially at Stanford, but really anywhere, would be concerned with human health. Mm -hmm. That's the expectation. But he runs a, I think it's fair to say, an advocacy center. They have programs to try to promote the vegan diet with doctors inside the university trying to get the vegan diet to be the default uh, meal at every school function, trying to influence Stanford University doctors. I mean, they have all kinds of projects and grants that are designed to increase adoption or, as they say, beha behavioral nudge theory to move people toward, more towards a plant-based diet. Well, that's not science. That's that's somebody with a strong point of view that they want to promote through advocacy projects, a film being an advocacy project. So you can't hear me? Yes. Okay, you can hear me. So if you thought about knowing what you know about the documentary and thinking about Think about, so Carrie of the uh, Homestead How YouTube channel is working on a documentary for Carnivore, and we don't want people to look at this documentary the same way with, you know, feeling that it wasn't done properly. So now it won't be based on a research study. It's going to be just a, a, a testimonial of some of the successes that have occurred for Carnivore. So when you think about that if you had to talk to Carrie and give him advice, anything you would say to him to make sure his documentary <laughs> is a higher quality documentary so that people can trust it a little bit more? Well, that's a good question. I think one way to earn trust is to have on a critic of the diet on the program and say, these are, these are, this is what people are worried about and let people hear it and then respond, understand. I mean, the state of the scientific literature on the carnivore diet is, is slim. Mm -hmm. So, and make that clear. Don't try to deny it. I mean, the vegan diet doesn't have a, maybe now it has one study, but it, it, it has virtually no clinical trial evidence to support the vegan diet, even though it's been all the rage for many, many years. Right. But you will not find that acknowledgement in any of these vegan documentaries. If mm -hmm. you in a doc in a film about carnivores simply said, look, we don't have the clinical trial evidence yet. We have a good survey tells us this. We have these anecdotal evidence. It's still premature, but we want to present to you what we have. Mm -hmm. That's honest. Yeah. These are the concerns about it. Let's talk about them. Yeah. You don't deny that they exist. I mean, the vegan film doesn't even acknowledge the new, the 
the nutritional deficiencies that happen on a vegan diet, Mm -hmm. which are severe, profound, pervasive. Mm -hmm. They don't even talk about that. If you say in a vegan diet, hey, one of the concerns about this diet is LDL cholesterol, and Mm -hmm. then talk about it. I think that makes you a a much more credible arbiter. I always try to get out ahead of any kind of criticism of what I'm saying. I say, look, this is a criticism out there. A lot of people think this. It's important to deal with what the the arguments are in the field. Yeah, and then I like I think that. People, yeah, I think then people re- you know recognize that you're you're not trying to hide anything, and you're not trying to overstate your case. That's right. I I actually like that idea. I I will absolutely share that because when I think about like I do take vitamin D3, K2, I do take uh, a, a, a mineral and electrolyte supplement because, uh, you know, I wasn't at first, but because of cramps periodically, I I think that I take omega-3 because I don't eat enough seafood. But, but, but I think people hearing, okay, what about constipation? What about all of these things that happen? when you're making this carnivore journey versus the plant-based journey. And I think it would be, I think it is disingenuous to not say to a person who is going down a vegan, you know, direction to not mention what, what do I do about my B12? What do I do about my omega-3 if I don't want to get a supplement from a, fish source, like, and I have to get it from, they need to know about algae, seaweed. They need to know that the vitamin A in plants has to be converted to an active form that's already in the animal form. And that when it's converted, only 10 or 15% is converted. They need to know these things. And if they, so I think if you start, start off that way, and oh, by the way, I still think this is better because that's that's honest. Oh, I I really think this other diet may be okay, but I just love animals, and I think we should never kill animals. That's really what I'm doing in this documentary. That's that's okay. It's okay to say that because, or you know, in my religion, we worship cows, and we we don't kill cows. Just say it. But 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 I think the problem is they do kind of sneak around these issues and they just, I just, I don't like the just blatant, like uh, for lack of better words, lies. I just want them to just be honest because is there really a perfect diet for everybody in spite of what we say in the low carb community? Not necessarily. I think there are, I think that people have to do their experiment and figure out what's best for them. But I do, I just, the average person, just like with politics, I mean, the average person is not going to know the nuances of politics. Therefore, they're just going to believe what they hear and they're not going to know the details. So so that's what bothers me about all of this and is, is why I think we should have these conversations. But it sounds like from your interpretation, Chris Gartner's, it, he's more of, he's doing advocacy not necessarily. My my hope was that Chris Gardner would be focused on let's help the world achieve metabolic health, but it sounds like he may have more of an advocacy role, and that sponsorship is going to impact the decisions you make. So, so let me tell you what his center does. He their group at his at Stanford is doing research into stealth nutrition, which he defines as using non-health related arguments such as animal rights to nudge people towards veganism. They have $25,000 grants on such topics as, quote, how to inspire behavioral change to improve attitudes around adopting more plant-based diets in different populations over time. And these grants have yielded projects such as Rethinking Meat 2.0, which is a one unit course at Stanford on alternatives to meat. They also have the Vegetarian Ambassador Program, which uses students to convince school administrators that vegan meals should be the default option at school events, like I mentioned. And they have an educational campaign to stimulate adoption of whole foods, plant-based diets among Stanford physicians. Okay, so that's not, that's not science. Right. Those are advocacy campaigns. Clear, very clear. 
And he, you know, he says his his motivation was getting in, involved in fighting climate change, animal rights. He really he he says that he was excited to be involved in this kind of advocacy because of the energy behind it, the people in it. It's you know, there's a lot of momentum behind these causes. But to be clear, that's not science. And the question he's asking is not what do we eat to get more healthy? It's just not his question. Right. And I think Stanford administrators should not be, have him in his medical school, put him in the sociology department, mm-hmm. or, right. like have him be in the, you know, in the advocacy, I don't know, political science, do whatever, whatever he's doing is not, is not in the biological sciences. So, yeah. But and that's I'm, the perception. The perception is that that's, I mean, his credentials and years of experience doing research should make him a pillar of this well, in see, theory. Yeah. And to me, maybe the larger point is, why does the nutrition community itself of scientists, researchers, why do they not blow the whistle? Why is a journalist talking about this? Why does the media not care? Why do scientists themselves not care about the credibility of their field? It looks so bad for the field. And sadly, Gardner is far from the, you know, he's far from the, he's not a singular case. Right. You know, I've done a substack on Walter Willett at Harvard University who accepts tons of money, has been an ideological vegan since the mid nineties, is hugely biased. There, the the level of bad science and bias and moneyed influence over our nutrition science is is just so pervasive and profound mm-hmm. and the field itself seems to not be able to repair itself yeah. they just don't have referees they don't have whistleblowers mm-hmm. they and this is what you know in my book the big fat surprise i was started documenting this starting in the 70s, where people who spoke out against the favored theory, then it was Ansel Keys, you know, the diet heart hypothesis, saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease. People who spoke out against that were lost their research grants and couldn't get their studies published and had their article journal articles pulled and were harassed by industry scientists at conferences. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of bullying that has gone on nutrition science and industry funding of science. It's just been a very fraught yeah. field for decades. And it's gotten to the point where bad behavior, corruption is so much the norm that it's the field itself is unable to correct itself, unable even to see these flaws. Yeah. I mean But that's the but that's the problem. Like the the if the information being shared is already accepted as the right thing to do. So nobody's going to question a twin study that only confirms what people are being taught. And even even when you say things like saturated fat is not associated with heart disease and is protective against stroke from the Journal of the College of Cardiology, that just goes like over their head. But when you put something in front of them, that aligns with this this way of thinking, which is fairly this plant based being better model seems to be almost like standard standard of care. But then it's not science what they're doing. I mean, Karl Popper, yeah. the you know the philosopher of science, famously said, "To be a scientist is to try to rigorously disprove one's own ideas." That's right. Okay, probably none of us is perfect as by that standard. But certainly when I was writing my book, I, I, I tacked on maybe an extra six months of research to try to disprove myself because I was so nervous about the claims right. I was making about saturated fat not being bad for health, vegetable seed oils. My book was the first book to really like out the problems of inflammation on seed oils. I I did try to find every flaw in my argument because it's terrifying going to press yeah. with those kinds of claims. But I think in nutrition science, they have just lost that habit. And, you know, even going back to Ansel Keys, so people who know that story, I mean, he was 
really the founder of modern nutrition science. And he famously said, I am right until proven wrong, Mm. which is the exact opposite of what Karl Popper said. He said, you should be wrong and try to rigorously disprove yourself until you can finally be satisfied that maybe the evidence suggests that you might be right. That's right. And so that's the attitude of a scientist. But nutrition science has just grown up with this other tradition, Mm non-scientific, full of politics, full of money. It is not a rigorous scientific endeavor. That's right. And until we, at least for LDL purposes, until we honor the fact that that's not a reliable marker, we're going to always have conversations that suggest the plant-based dietary approach is better. Because every time I listen to a influencer who's plant-based or a colleague who's plant-based, rather it's my cardiology colleagues or others, they, they just lean on the LDL and that's it. And then once you, and they don't, they're, they're, and because that's so important to them, the other metabolic markers, which improve at a, at a great clip with low carb, they just kind of blow it off. And, 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 and more importantly, what I find is that people in the medical community still give the medical approach with drugs a heavier weight than the dietary approach for many reasons. But so when I review things that I need to review to maintain my board certification, it is often what medicine do we add to make the therapeutic effect even better? And you'll end up with five, six, you know, medicines that do what the diet could do so easily. So if you say, how did Jardius become a very popular drug, which makes you urinate out glucose, which is going to help your blood sugar be lower because you're urinating out glucose. Why is it also now this really good drug for cardiovascular disease? Well, well, if you urinate out glucose, you're going to probably remove fluid. That's going to help. You're probably going to reduce inflammation. That's going to help. And I can go down the list of other impacts, but at the end of the day, if we reduce the glucose in your diet, you would need to spend the money on that drug. So I just think how we're trained to focus on these interventions is flawed. And I don't think the average clinician has really gotten a memo that people are reversing disease like Dr. Sarah Hallberg was trying to teach us. I just think that they haven't seen it. In- well, yeah, I mean, you know, this whole world of doctors much better than I do. But, I, you know, there I think that the the medical training is largely influenced by the pharmaceutical companies yeah. and what they they're the, so that doctors are trained to that, that a visit should involve writing a prescription for something. Pretty much. Yeah. And I remember going to my doctor with some problem that I was experiencing. And and he's like, well, I have this drug. I have this drug. I have this drug. And I was like, none of them are appropriate for what I have. He's like, well, that's the end of what I can do for you. And I was like, well, I still have this problem, you know, <laughs> doctor. <laughs> so I that revealed to me how clear it was. Like, he's got the, you know, it's the drugs. The drugs lead the the response. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you have a drug to treat it, you're treating it, but there's no, and there's no understanding of the root cause or a desire to understand the root cause. And I have to say, I have a very fancy New York doctor. He's completely uninterested mm-hmm. in the knowledge that I have. Yeah. I keep saying to him, Hey, doc, do you know that you could reverse your type 2 diabetes with a low carbohydrate diet? And he has sick patients. You know, people are right. not healthy, you know, the high stress lifestyle in New York City. He's like, Oh, that's interesting. No further questions. I wow. said, oh, wow, you know, I lost weight. I'm I'm a 50-something-year-old woman. I lost weight since my last visit, and which is kind of unusual. And, like, any questions about that? No questions. Meanwhile, he's gained 10 pounds. You know, I mean, just no zero curiosity. He's a very fancy doctor. Yeah. And I, I, I keep on, I keep going to, so that if I get into a car crash, I will have somebody to right. 
he was well connected to send me to like get me a slot at the orthopedic whatever so i just i think i think there's a lack of curiosity it's not the there's a lot of pressure to treat people with pharma doctors are penalized for not you know for not prescribing statins i mean we all i'm sure you've covered this in your podcast yes so i mean we just have we have a terrible sick care system Mm -hmm. that is designed to prolong sickness, not to create good health. And in fact, as you also have probably shared with your listeners, that that doctors are graded as, and, and healthcare is graded as being how well you get a patient to adhere to a medication, mm-hmm. not whether they're getting better. So this, this promotes adherence and the prolongation of medication. That was what came out of when the Obamacare compromise was basically mm-hmm. the drug companies getting the deal that, that, that continuing your medication was the mark of a good doctor. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, at least they don't That's say. outrageous. It is. They don't say compliance anymore. They say adherence, but you're right. Medication adherence is one of the marks of a really good doctor. Wow. Isn't That's that amazing? Perplexing. Yes, amazing. So for so, you, for getting your patients off their medications, you are failing at adherence. You're and, a failure in the and, eyes of the healthcare system. And, and the system, and what's good is that we are paid more to take care of sick people because it takes more time and resources. What's bad is that I get paid less if I heal them because I can't keep on the chart all of those diagnoses that allow me to be compensated better. Right. So how backwards is that? So we have a lot of work to do. And if you were, so you're doing work as we kind of wrap up with the Nutrition Coalition, how is that work evolving? And, you know, where where are you on that journey? Well, I would say most of my work right now is in journalism. So if you want to see my the writing that I'm doing, I'm it, it's mainly on Substack Unsettled Science is the name of the newsletter I do with Gary Taubes, and maybe you can put that in your show notes. Yeah, I, I that's the that's where most of my efforts are going. The Nutrition Coalition continues to follow the dietary guidelines process. There will be a an, a so called expert scientific report by the advisory committee coming out this summer. Then there'll be a new set of guidelines as of the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Those are the 2025 dietary guidelines. They're expected to be as bad as ever. Mm-hmm. And we have slightly eased off some of our work because we accomplished an enormous amount by we got four reports by the National Academy of Sciences documenting all the problems in the methodology of the dietary guidelines and the fact that they don't address chronic disease. The whole guidelines do not address the now 93% of American adults diagnosed with <laughs> metabolic conditions. So and yet they're hugely controlling and influential over our school lunches, our cafeteria food, our feeding programs for the elderly. I mean, everything is the military, everything is controlled by the dietary guidelines. So there's this very influential policy. They're issued by the USDA and HHS. HHS is captured by the pharma industry. USDA is completely captured by the food industry. We discovered as part of our work that 95% of the last committee had some kind of conflict with food or pharma. And the current committee has about 50% of con- you know, of them have conflicts. We found that the department inside the USDA that runs the dietary guidelines has nearly 100 partnerships with food companies. I mean, it's a captured agency. It's a captured system. Our ability to change that on a kind of shoestring budget is so limited. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm proud of what we've done. We raised a lot of awareness, but we are up against the multi-billion dollar food and pharma industries. And I don't expect the guidelines to change a lot. Yeah, I think they might try to lower even further the cap on saturated fat, even though there's absolutely no evidence for it because that 
saturated, if you can lower saturated fat, you can further reduce the amount of meat and dairy that people consume. Saturated fat is right, like the rate limiting factor. We're seeing in this dietary guidelines in particular, a drive to water down the definition of protein so that more and more plant-based proteins can replace animal proteins. So more plant milks, more Mm -hmm. whatever, more plant-based so-called proteins, which are not complete proteins, which are not as bioavailable, are not good sources of protein by any means and are high in carbohydrates. So double whammy of bad news with those Mm -hmm. proteins. But we see an effort to try to dilute the amount of meat and dairy that are allowed and therefore fed to our children and our poor people and Mm -hmm. and our military and and many other populations. So we're still trying to keep that awareness alive at least, but I guess we, you know, I have come to the conclusion that like without a treasure, a war chest of many millions of dollars or a presidential candidate who really wants to take this on, Mm -hmm. you know, I have been in conversations with more than one of them, but it's, it's, you know, it's really, it's really a difficult challenge to change the course of this Titanic. Mm, okay. So, you know, I'm proud of what we've done, but I, I just think it's limited what we can continue to do. Okay. I mean, if I told you, I can't even go into the story of how they've ignored all the science on the low carb diet, but we have amazing evidence showing that they knew about it. They studied it. They buried that evidence. They continue to bury the evidence they pretend it's not there. I mean, yeah. more than a hundred clinical trials, they pretend don't exist. Even though, you know, <laughs> um, um, members of the committee themselves have participated in these experiments. They turn around on the committee and say, Oh, we can't find any evidence. So it's, it's just beyond crazy what's going on with those guidelines. And it's awful because, you know, they are driving obesity and other diet related diseases in America. And, you know, we're beyond crisis. We're, yeah. we're <laughs> I mean, to quote Sarah Hallberg in one of her talks, she goes, she's like, this is beyond an emergent crisis. This is not even urgent. We need to be in panic mode. That's right. That's right. And she's right. And I have, again, the privilege of having learned there's another way has really helped a lot of people. And I'm so thankful that the patients who are hearing a different way are actually responding to it. They're actually healing, and I'm actually a little surprised that so many people have responded with their motivation. And because most people want to heal, most people want to be here for their families. Most people want the quality of their life to be good. So if you give them the right tools, they'll be successful. And 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 I I I just shared with a colleague who had not heard about the DASH versus keto uh, study that was done in June or released in June. And it showed that, you know, not following that DASH diet that has all the grains, seven to eight servings of grains per day, eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And just the grains and the fruit are going to wreak havoc on a person with diabetes body. Right. So nobody should be surprised when you remove those things that the other diet's going to win, which was the keto diet. So I just think the doctors are not aware of these things. And, you know, it was interesting because I did share that with my colleagues, just more of a local clinic. And, and it was more of a, okay, thanks for letting us know. And it's just weird that the standard of care, which is not really getting the results we want to see, is challenged. And then the challenge is showing you that the other diet is better, and yet it doesn't move the needle. It's almost like, what do you have to do? You got to yell from the rooftops and people are still not listening. So all I can do is continue to do this podcast and take care of my patients and speak at conferences and pray that that's enough. Well, you're doing great work, Tony. And you gave, I mean, for all of your listeners, you gave a fantastic talk at the Sarah Hallberg course, which I want to say is not just for healthcare practitioners, but for patients too. Totally usable, fantastic information, especially by you and Ron Sinha. I mean, you were 
fantastic. So I urge all your listeners to go listen to that lecture and, or take the course and yeah, you're doing great work. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with the rest of the medical profession, except for they've somehow settled into this paradigm by which they're used to people being sick. They're used to not being able to do anything. They're just like in a state of depression or resignation about what the system that they're in, mm-hmm. but you know, doctors are depressed and yes, they're, they you know, or what's the word burnout is what, yeah. you know, they're suffering in the field. They don't even know that there's another way to be. Mm-hmm. They don't. And so, and I feel sorry for them. They've, they, they're really bright people go into medicine and then they really get a, they're delivered a load of misinformation and That's a right. pitiful, terrible life of watching their patients get worse and worse and worse. And it, that's right. I feel mainly just sorry for these people. Yeah. So, but you know, it takes people like you in your gun, your Gandhi in your Gandhi clothes. <laughs> 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 You're doing great work and I'm doing what I can from my that's side. Right. And, you know, I think you more than anybody understand how it really takes a village and that everybody has to hold hands and try to move forward on this together. That's right. Well, that segue us to the last question, which you've heard before, because this is your second appearance on the podcast and that's the, how you're going to protect your nest. So when you think about, you know, rather it's nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, protecting your thoughts, recovering from trauma, making sure your relationships are healthy making sure you avoid things like organisms and pollutants that can harm you and or protecting your emotions and making sure your life experiences serve you. When you think about those things, what will you be doing over the next 12 months to protect your nest? Okay. Well, you know, only really my therapist and I are privy to all that information. <laughs> Good man. So, uh, what am I doing? I'm, I am, I mean, I'm actually like, I, I don't have like a great, like, I know there are people who come on your podcast, have these fantastic lifestyles <laughs> where they're cold plunging and going to saunas right. and taking, I mean, I'm just not that person. I, I live in a busy city and I have kids to take after, you know, look after. So I'm trying to become a better cook on the home front, you know, meals that my kids like and that yeah. are still healthy. I'm really investing in that and I just got an Instapot. I'm trying to nice. do that for our family. I'm trying to meditate like 10 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get exercise like five times a week. That's good for me. I do a lot of walking. I mean, I, I live really far from an ideal lifestyle, but I think I'm trying not to be judgmental of myself. I'm trying to write a journal with my thoughts more and be more in touch with those. But, you know, for somebody who's been in this nutrition space a really long time, I'm right. I'm like surprisingly, uh, you know, I'm just, I think I'm just really like an average person just trying to get along and mostly do the right thing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. And, it sounds like you are doing a lot of the things I would encourage people to do. So I'm happy you're kind of doing a little bit of each of those things, but don't take yourself too seriously, which is what you're doing. You're like, listen, I'm going to do better, but I'm not going to, you don't want to stress about doing better because that's not good for you either. So, so thank you for sharing that. I think it's clear. You've already shared how people can find you in your work. So I'll make sure to share that. And again, thank you so much for spending a little time with me on the podcast for the second time. We'll continue to work together and uh, I'll make sure to make sure our audience knows how to get to all those resources because I really think that the privilege of being able to teach is just something that was, I felt like I was born to do. So I appreciate you, you know, being part of the team that invited me to participate in that uh, honoring that honoring of Dr. Sarah Hallberg. I appreciate you, Nina. Well, thank you very much, Tony. It's really good to talk to you. Absolutely. And for my audience, it sounds like Nina has taught us to be more skeptical and it's okay to be skeptical. I, I, I still think documentaries have an important role to play 
and educating the public, but should always be viewed through a critical lens, especially since their intent are not always to simply convey facts, but in some cases share propaganda. So, so whenever you guys watch a documentary, I want you guys to just pause for a moment, ask a few questions, something as simple as who sponsored it. As Nina suggested, sometimes information is right there in front of you, right? It'll be at the beginning or the end. And if you hear a, a claim, you don't necessarily have to be an expert. You don't have to be a journalist or a doctor, scientist. You can just have listen to conversations like this. Maybe you'll hear uh, someone on YouTube like Nina just did talk about it. Maybe you'll read her article on Substack. You can do those things, but never just go with what's in front of you and assume it's all true. And finally, you know, never make life-altering health decisions based on a documentary, right? So make sure you vet it thoroughly and make sure it's the right thing for you and your family. So, uh, because when I went down that rabbit hole that told me, you know, maybe it was, I can't remember which documentary, but it was kind of a, I think it was actually a book. It was How to Disease Proof Your Kids. And that book, which was really about my kids, put me down this plant-based rabbit hole. I never questioned it. It was an expert opinion and I just trusted it blindly. And then I trusted the blue zones blindly. And then I trusted the, 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 you know, the, the large study, the uh, large plant-based study that was by Colin uh, Campbell. And, and I never questioned it. And I didn't know what an observational study was versus a randomized controlled trial. So, so we all make these mistakes. But once I started to question things, I went down a different path and I started to heal. So I want that for my audience. I want that for Dr. Nina. <laughs> I want it for all who are here to uh, hear this message of healing. So, so for those who joined us today, I appreciate you. Thank you. Share anything you'd like to share in the comments and share the video or the podcast with friends and families. And until we do it again, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.